three or four different kinds of species this time of year. So, but let's talk about rufuses. And the last hummingbird bathing project. So um, thank you everybody for coming to my talk. Um, for those of you who are not um, familiar with my project, um, I am a 501c3 scientific and educational nonprofit that I started in 2015. I've been working with hummingbirds since 2006 when I used to live in Chinika Bay Village on Evans Island in Western Prince William Sound. I started banding hum hummingbirds in 2006 as a subpermittee under Stacy John Peterson, who was the only master class hummingbird bander in the state at that time. Uh, I eventually um, began getting all sorts of great information. Yeah, this way, right? Yep. And. Um, <clears throat> The uh, head of the bird banding laboratory at the time, uh, Dr. Bruce Peterjohn, he encouraged me to get my master class hummingbird banding license. Um, and uh, uh, Stacy was no longer banding. He was what we call a hobby bander at the time, not someone who was actually doing a lot of research. And <clears throat> in the beginning of the 2000s, we were really starting to realize um, that we needed to know a lot more about rufous hummingbirds than we did. And we didn't know a lot to begin with. And rufous hummingbirds are having a real hard time um, nowadays. So with the help of uh, Dr. Peter John and a couple of our master class hummingbird bander certified teachers, of which there's only five in the United States, I received my master um, banding certifica certification, which took me seven years to obtain. And the reason why it takes so long to get these certifications is because hummingbird banding is some of the most detailed and I would say stressful bird banding that you can do. Um, you can see on this picture here, this little guy, my the, um, the red, red button, yes. Right there is a little, 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 tiny band. And these are rufous hummingbirds. They wear a 5.2, 5.6 millimeter band. And I'm going to pass that around, and that's the size of the band that's put on these. And I forgot to bring my example. I asked Milo if he had a duck band, spare duck band he could bring, and he didn't say. And I forgot to bring my. So most people who are banding, like guys, oh, yeah. there's one right there. <laughs> if they're doing ducks or geese or something like that, I'm going to call up the uh, bird banding class where we order all our, our bands. Um, and they send them to you already shaped and formed and already done. You just basically put it on the bird desk board desk. So with hummingbirds, we actually um, have to shape and form the bands ourselves. We get them in a sheet from the laboratory um, and, and cut them. And each band has to be specifically cut and sized for the specific species of hummingbird that I'm using. In some species, there's also a variation in band size between the males and the females. So when you're banding birds and you're handling immature birds, you really got to know what you're handling. So you put the right size band on the bird. You put a band that's too big, the band falls off, that's lost data, boo, we cry tears. If the band is too small, ooh, we cry a lot of tears because the first rule in my work is don't damage the data, right? Okay, so <clears throat> to tell you a little bit more about the rufous hummingbird, which is the main species of birds that I work with at, in uh, Alaska here. This is the North Gulf Coast, is the northernmost species breeding range. I also work with Hannah's hummingbirds, which is a completely different presentation, so you're going to have to wait to the next presentation to talk about those guys. One thing I want to point out is you will notice there is an orange dot on the male's head, there's a white dot on this female's head. I put those there. They didn't come that way. And the reason I do that is because when these birds are banded and they're flying, they tuck their feet up into their feathers and you cannot see that band. And the birds will come right back into the trap once I've banded them. And I don't want to, I don't want to see you right now. Come back next year and we'll catch you again. So that's just a visual clue for me to know that I've recently banded this bird. It's also a key for you guys who are maintaining hummingbird feeders. If you see a bird that has a dot on its head, I want to know about it for two reasons. One, it gives me an idea of how far these birds are traveling locally, right? And it also gives me an idea of um, how long that dot of pain is staying on its head and a few other things. So if you see a dotted bird show up on your feeder, please let me know. 
So six degrees north, um, most of us know where we're, where we're at. I'm going to be giving this presentation down in Sedona this year. So uh, some of this information is for those people who've never been to Alaska and don't know exactly where we are. And along that note, if anybody catches a typo or sees something that's not quite right, please let me know so I can fine tune this for the July presentation. So those who don't know where Chiniga Bay is, it's right in there. And of course, we're in Cordova right here. And hummingbirds come up. And they are just right, really, exactly along this riparian edge, right here. Occasionally, they spill, spill over into the Anchorage Bowl, but you're not going to find them there in any real numbers. And there's a couple of birds that like to hang out in Kodiak as well. Okay. So what do we know about Rufus hummingbirds? Actually, we don't know all that much. Some of the things that we do know right now is we know that they are a species that's having a lot of problems. Their population has declined over 70% in the past 50 years. Especially on their winter habitat, they're having a really rough time. But we do know, uh, we don't know much about their life histories. We don't have any breeding studies. If you find a nest of a rufous hummingbird, please let me know. That's another thing that I would like to document. We do know a lot about their cognitive abilities. These guys have amazing spatial memory. Not only do they remember exactly where that bush was that they were feeding off of last year, but they know exactly which flower umble they fed off a half an hour ago. And they know these so specifically, so they don't waste energy going to a flower that they recently fed off, right? So that's why when you hang your feeder here one year, and they're used to coming to the feeder. And next year, you decide you're going to hang your feeder over here. And they go, wait a minute. It was here. And now it's over here. Right? So because they're, they're remembering where it used to be. We also know that they have incredible flight dynamics. By studying hummingbirds and bumblebees, we discovered drone technology. We wouldn't have had that without those types of studies. So on an average year, rufuses will show up, the males first, right around the last week of April, the first week of May. Usually I get a call from Pete Mickelson out there at the edge of Hartney telling me that he's seen a bird around the 21st. We'll see if that holds true this year. The females show up about seven to 10 days later. They will disappear from around the feeders because we're at peak bug and bloom and they're sitting on eggs and they're incubating. So they're very rarely, we'll see them for about a 10 day period around the end of May, beginning of June, unless we have a severe weather event and then they may need to come to the feeders to eat. By mid, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the males will start feeding up and out migrating. By the end of June, the females show up on, showing up back on the feeders around that same time. And roughly 10 days to two weeks later, we'll start seeing the first fledglings. The males are gone by first week or two of July. Females leave a week or so later, and then the babies will finally leave at the end of July. Where are they going? That's coming. <laughs> so uh, if you have any questions, please hold them to the end, because more than likely I will have answered them by the time I get there. So troglids, hummingbirds are troglids. What is a troglid? They're the only birds that can truly hover and are capable of both forward and backwards flight. They feed on nectar, sap wells, and a significant amount of insects. It's one of the very first things that they will feed on when they get here in the spring is this right here, the blooming alders and willows. And bugs will come in and get stuck on the sticky sap, and the birds will come in and get a double bite of both carbohydrates and proteins, and boy, do they need it because they show up here and they have absolutely no fat on their bodies whatsoever and they're tired and they're hungry and they've got to get to work immediately. The next thing that comes along is the blueberries, especially the high bush blueberries. Along with that is the crowberries, the um, elderberries, uh, all sorts of those uh, first flowering species. Now, the blueberries are incredibly important. They're usually the first thing that blooms after the alders and willows. And the snow load pays, plays a big part in the timing of when these birds show up. The next big, big thing after the blueberries is, of course, our salmon berries. So, oh, 
Miss my animation. Let me try that again. There we go. I'm doing my animations. Spent a lot of time on these. Okay. <laughs> so the nests are built with moss. They're lined with plant down like cotton grass and willow and poplar fluff, wiry fluff. Um, and they're held together with um, spider webbing and uh, lichen and bark. The female lays two eggs. She incubates them for about 15 to 17 days. The young become independent after about 21 days of um, hatching. And they have an estimated lifespan of about 10 to 12 years in the wild. And if you notice, there's a fly right there to show you the relative size. And these two fat little guys, so the wonderful thing about this nest construction is that spider web is, elect is elastic. So as the birds grow, the, the nest kind of expands with those fat little babies. Okay. So hummingbirds are a lot more cold tolerant than you think. They are capable of a short period of hibernation called torpor. And that comes in handy when these males show up this time of year, we've got snow on the ground, we can drop below freezing, we can have a weather event. So these birds will just go find a sheltered spot, big, thick part of the spruce trees, and they just shut everything down. And they actually will just hibernate for 24 hours or so, 12 hours. They can't really go much longer than 48, um, but then they, the weather warms up and they'll warm up and they'll kind of shiver themselves awake and off they go buzzing after the insects. So this is um, my house in Chenega that I used to live in. And um, this is, there's traps around these feeders, and I used to have a ladder to get up there. So that's about a six-foot uh, height right there, so you can see how much snow is still on a normal year in 2010. Who remembers snow apocalypse? Yeah, we're always shoveling our roofs off. So this greenhouse has got a 12-foot high roof. That's about a six-foot door right there. And that snow was, was all the way up there, so it's like 10 feet of snow in April. On, on snow apocalypse here. And there's a poor guy going, oh God, what did I do? Okay, but some some years we have hardly any snow. Everything comes up and is blooming all at once and the birds pretty much all show up at once and get immediately to work. So again, spring arrival timing and breeding is hugely dependent on our snow load and our bloom. So rufous hummingbirds are very vocal. A lot of times you will hear, looks like you're starting to try to click it, um, tup calls. So these are basically just, they're not necessarily alarm calls, but they're like, I'm aware of you, you're making me slightly uncomfortable, I know that you're there, or they're a little annoyed, they'll do these little tup calls. Okay, oops. And then we have the Rufus display call. So I want you to listen for this before I play it. So there's a general diagram of what they do. So the males will get up on a sunlit branch or exposed, something that's exposed that the sun can get on him. And he can flash his gorget. And he's like, okay, are you looking? Are you looking? And then he goes up and he goes way high up and he does this, oops. And he does this big dive. Zoom. At the bottom of this dive, he's clocking somewhere around 200 miles an hour. And he's pulling more G's than a fighter pilot pulls in his jet. And at the end of the dive, as he pulls up, his, um, <clears throat> his wings will make these high-pitched noise. And at the end of the dive, as he pulls up, he'll come parallel, and he'll go beep, 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 with his tail. He does this little tail wag. And you'll hear in the call that little wag. So here's the, see if you can hear that when he does the tail wag. So that's what he's doing there. Okay. All right. Stop. All right. Thank you. Okay. Now, there's one other um, display that you might see rufous males doing in particular, and, and the females are pretty much uh, green and slightly rufous colored, and they, they're really camouflaged unless you see them on the feeder. 
So a lot of times you'll spot a male doing this, and if you see a male doing this, you know that there's a female very, very close by. So he's been doing his jelly dive, and he sees a female. Ah! So he's going to fly up to her. He's going to really close to her, and he's going to get right in her face. He's going to zing, 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 and he's like arcs back and forth right in front of her face, and she's like, oh, God, please, really? Right? And then he'll either make or she'll reject him and take off. Now, males are polygamous. They will mate with as many females as they possibly can get. They will guard their territory and guard their females. The females will mate with other males, but don't tell him. And there's still a lot of genetic studies that need to be done on this. And um, frankly, taking blood from a hummingbird to do genetics is not something I, I really want to do at this point. <laughs> So this is a traditional map of where Rufus hummingbirds would spend their winters and their summers. This map is circa 2000, 2001, somewhere in there. And we were just starting to get these reports in the southeast of the United States of Rufus hummingbirds in the wintertime. And they were saying, ah, it's not right. These are strays. It's not, you know, they're not staying there. They're going, they're coming across the Gulf and they're wintering where they're supposed to winter. Well, part of the work that I've done over the past 15 years has proven that that's not true. So what is the, and the other question was, what is the migration route that they're taking to get up to Alaska? So that brings me to um, my first big set of data, um, nine years of Rufus recaptures in um, Chiniga. Um, this paper has just been, uh, should be published any moment now in the Western Bird Banding um, Journal. And I do believe it's one of, the one of the papers that has the longest set of data for Rufus recaptures. Um, so here we are again, where we are. Uh, there's my sound. There is Chiniga Bay, we're over here in Cordoba, here is, now don't get confused, that's Chiniga Island where the original Chiniga village, native village of Chiniga used to be, that village was destroyed in the 1964 earthquake and tsunami, and they reestablished new Chiniga Bay on Evans Island. These people, this happens all the time, people go out on the ferry and they think they're going to, you know, and they get in the wrong spot and then they don't know where the heck they are. Everybody's very confused. Okay, so here is a nice graph with numbers and colors and things. So basically what I just want you to get out of this graph is um, we've split our categories up into four categories. Adult males, adult females, hatch, hatch year males, birds born that season, and hatch year females. So this is my um, Chiniga data. This first year is the year I was being trained, and we started halfway through the season when the males had already left. So that's why we don't have any males in 2007. There were males there, but they left before I started to get torn. And then 2012, the snow apocalypse year. So you can see the really big difference in bird numbers we had that year just because of the snow year. Okay. And, and then this is beginning here in Cordova. So in total, I've um, captured about uh, over 3,700 birds since 2006. And uh, that's uh, tw oh, just about 2,500 birds in Chiniga and just uh, under uh, 2,000 here in Cordova as of last season. Okay, so how faithful are they? We were talking about site fidelity. So these are the birds that I've banded, and these are the number of recaptured birds. So this number exists outside. These are brand new bands for that year, and then these are birds that I've recaptured that have been banded in previous years. It might have been the previous season. It might have been a season or so before. Okay. And that, um, so for those nine years, our uh, recapture total averaged to be 18%. For most mark and recapture type pro, uh, programs, it's much less than that. It's usually around 6%. And there's two reasons why this number is real high. One, I'm on the breeding grounds. So the birds are coming here and they're stopping. A lot of those types of banding um, uh, stations and stuff are working on the migration route. Birds are passing through. Okay. 
And these birds are super site fidelities. They will come back to the same place every year to breed as long as it exists there and is a good place for them to breed. Now, as they're traveling on their migration routes, those migration routes might vary depending on weather, habitat loss, all sorts of variables we may not even totally be aware of. So if you're at a banding station on the migratory route, you may or may not catch that same bird every year because that may, bird may not be coming through that exact location that year. So that's one reason why um, my uh, percent is really high. But it also just speaks to these birds' site fidelity. And then here in Cordoba, um, so most of these birds, almost all of these birds, uh, as the, like a handful, like six birds, were all banded at my house in Chiniga. Now here in Cordoba, I have several different banding sites. I might be focusing on one banding site more than another in, in any given season, in any given week during my season. So it's a little bit harder to, to um, have a um, consistent effort and time to get that, um, that consistent recapture percentage. Oops. Oh, just one quick question, those recaps, are those recaps after the banding year? Yes. They're not recaptures the same season? Correct. Yeah. Correct. I try not to catch that. Why the data white paints on the side. I already caught you. Go away. See you next year. <laughs> uh, just point out some pictures here. So these are two birds that are in um, banding net bags waiting their inspection period time. Uh, usually this goes very, very quickly. Uh, between the time I've caught the bird in a trap, so this is another type of trap, and I just drop that curtain down and grab the birds out of so by the time my hand is in the trap, removing the bird to the time the bird is released, is usually an average of about 90 seconds. I try not to have them any more than three minutes. Uh, and if we're in a situation where we're catching a lot of babies, uh, like in the beginning of July, if I'm at Diane Weiss's and we're just at tons of birds piling up on the feeders. And I've got someone helping me catch birds, someone scribing for me. We might have some birds lined up, but we're still processing them within five minutes. So, and if they start, if, then we stop. We process the birds that we have and get them out. So again, the health and safety of the bird comes first. Okay, so we don't damage the data. Okay. So, repeat performances. To have you a moment to admire this little guy coming off the, out of the rain onto my porch, appreciating the theater that is there for him. So um, here are all the birds that I caught in Chiniga, separated out. And then this is how many times I caught that particular bird. So for example, I caught 2,446 birds one time. They, get, they got caught, they got a ban. 335 birds, I've caught twice. Three birds, I, uh, excuse me, three times I caught 60 birds. Um, 15 birds, I've caught four times. And four birds, I caught five times, which those were my longevity records. Um, so that's pretty amazing um, uh, numbers right there. Not many other people have, have got that kind of data either. Okay. We'll come back to that. So there are two types of recaptures. We have what we call local recaptures, which is just the graph that I just showed you. These are the birds that I've banded who've gone off to do their winter thing, come back, I've caught them again. Those are what's called local recaptures. And that data is super, super important. It teaches us about site fidelity, timing, um, all sorts of natural history information. But it's the foreign recaptures that what we call gold. So a foreign recapture is a bird that I may have banded or someone else has banded and then someone else has recovered it. So either I banded it and someone else has recovered it somewhere else along its migratory route or vice versa. So the very first one that we got, this bird was banded on January 13th in 2010 in Tallahassee, Florida. It was the first confirmed link of a rufous hummingbird wintering in the southeastern United States. No, this bird did not go to Mexico City. And I recaught her on June 28th in Chinigua Bay, which means she was probably born in Chinigua Bay. And she went all the way down to Tallahassee to spend her winter. 
This was the long distance record for any hummingbird species to be caught on either end of its migration. This record still stands today. So let's trace the flight, the flight pattern for these. So Tallahassee, Florida to Chenega Bay, Alaska. That's about 3,500 miles in a straight line. Did that bird fly in a straight line? I highly doubt it. For one thing, there's a whole bunch of desert all through here, right? Not a lot for a hummingbird to feed on. So what we were thinking is what these birds are coming down here and then going up the coast, but we have no proof of that. So what, what designates proof is catching more birds. I want you to note on this, it's hard to see. I have another picture that's better. You can see a dot there and a dot there. That was the previous long distance recovery for a Rufus. That was, um, was Alabama to British Columbia. So the second form we captured, this bird was a real fun bird. So she was banded as a fledgling uh, in Fort Davis Mountains, Texas in 2012 in August. Think about that date. Late August in Texas, she was banded. She was recaptured in Chenega Bay on July 4th in 2013. Okay, Erin, here's, here's your trivia question. What's, what's significant about that date for this particular bird? That's really do, fast. Do, 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 do. <laughs> that bird was born in Chenega. When would she have left Chenega? July. And she made it all the way down to Fort Davis, Texas in less than three weeks at less than a month old of age. That's pretty impressive. Probably not the beginning of July either. Right, right. She probably would have left mid-July. Yeah. And guess what? She did it again. There she is. Hello, sweetheart. Here's your little band. And I caught her again in Chenega in 2014, two years later. And so she turned out to be one of my first longevity records. Unfortunately, we never spotted her again after that. I, kept, I was hoping that uh, the fellows in, in West Texas would catch her and then we could like play ping pong, but that didn't happen, unfortunately. But it was pretty cool to catch her twice. So a few more foreign recaptures um, happened in 2014 and 2015. So the first one was an Alaska banded bird that was found in, Ste in uh, Steamboat Springs in August of 2014. Second bird was found in Mill Valley, California. This bird um, still is one of my lo longest longevity birds. So she um, was found in 2015. I banded her as an adult in, 20 in 2009. So she was at least a year old. Once they turn adults, there's no real way to tell how old they are. So this bird was at least 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, at least seven years old, probably older than that. And I think the longevity record for a wild caught rufus was like eight years, I think, so far. So I'm hoping to beat that record. That's one of my goals. Unfortunately, this poor bird was found dead. Um, but Somebody saw her, picked her up, and they looked closely enough on her and saw that band. And that's what's important. If you find a banded bird or a band, report it. You can go to the USGS web, web page, and it says report a band right on top, put in all the information, and they send you a neat little postcard that tells you where that bird was, all the details about it, if it had been recovered before and anywhere, and then the bander gets that information as well. And that's how we can build our information. So here's the trajectories of those birds coming out of Alaska. So these birds are probably are heading to Mexico, but these birds I think are coming, are, well, this one for sure was going to Tallahassee. So I think we've got two groups of birds. We've got birds that are wintering here, and now we have birds that are wintering on the Southeast coast. So let's look at our migration map again. And so we've determined that we have what's called a racetrack migration. So in the spring, 
the birds come up the coast, and in the fall, they're going to come out and come, follow the Rocky Mountains down, and then they fan out, some going this way and some going that way. Now, here's another trivia question. What's happening, especially in the last few years, when these birds are traveling through here in July and August? What's been going on? Wildfires. Wildfires. Yep. Which is not good for little baby birds trying to find their way to the winter hunting grounds. So, threats to roof is hummingbirds. Habitat loss through urban, uh, urbanization, uh, fires, agricultural crops. Insecticides is a huge threat, especially these neonectid insecticides. These, for, these, these are bioaccumulative. These birds pick it up and they carry it with them, and it's causing all sorts of physiological short term and long term problems. And of course, climate change, which is exasperates wildfires, out of season, and extreme weather events. So the Western Hummingbird Partnership, of which uh, I contribute, uh, is a wonderful group made up of a whole bunch of organizations and little tiny people like me, uh, banders, uh, who contribute to Rufus Science and Conservation. They just recently put out this status, uh, the, the state of science and conservation for the Rufus Hummingbird. It is free. You can go online and pick that up. And there's some really beautiful artwork in there as well as very valuable information on the on the conservation status of these birds. So let's review our timeline. So birds are coming in right about now. Put out your feeders now, get ready for the males and the females will be arriving shortly thereafter. Remember we got a little lull. And then the males will start feeding up. And this is when they really start defending the feeders. And we can talk about that later, how to how to mitigate for that. They take off, and then the fledglings show up, and then the females say, bye, kids, I'll see you later, and then the kids follow mom a short time later. So, be, uh, so for your feeding tips, remember, keep it clean. My rule of thumb is never put anything out there for the birds to drink that you wouldn't drink yourself. I regularly change my feeders once a week. If it's hot or there's a lot of birds using it and the, feed, the syrup is looking kind of ooky, I change the, the feeder. Least hit a black mold, get that feeder down, clean it up really good before you put it out. Um, I like just tend to use just OxyClean, and I got a good bottle brush, and I got a little tiny brush to clean out the feeder ports. You can get these from most feeder supply stores. Uh, uh, they're not very expensive at all. You can get a little, a little brush kit and just rinse them really well. Um, make sure you can't smell the OxyClean or the vinegar anymore. You don't need to boil your sugar water. It's a one to four mixture. Just enough to dissolve that sugar is good enough. Don't need any red dyes. That stuff wasting your money on that and it's probably not very good for the birds either. So don't buy any of that pre-made hummingbird dye either. Nothing but pure sugar, not raw sugar, not honey, not sucrose, none of that other stuff. Pure sugar. It has the closest, um, is the word I'm using right, carbohydrate um, makeup of nectar. A flower nectar is the pure sugar. Okay, if you raise or lower that carbohydrate ratio, you can really actually mess them up. You don't want to do that. Okay, so before we get to questions, I just want to say thank you to my banding host, uh, Diane. I've been banding out at Diane Weiss's place since 2015. I've probably taken at least 500 birds off from her porch. Um, Wendy and uh, Steve Rainey are my new banding hosts. Um, I started establishing feeders out there last year. I'm hoping for a really good banding season out there this year. And uh, again, I'm just a small nonprofit. I am, I, it's my own money, volunteers, small single donations, and the occasional small grant. I am not funded by um, state or federal government or large organizations or large grant funders. Uh, Last Scott Conservation Foundation and the Cordova Community Foundation, which is a affiliate of the Alaska Community Foundation, has recently funded me, and for that I'm very grateful to for them. Um, uh, Angela uh, Butler and Bob and Bob Jewell have also been supporting me. Super happy for them. Starting a new relationship with Kenai Design Company, which are hopefully going to shoot me out some really cool apparel with a new logo for me. And the International Hummingbird Society is our host at the Sedona Hummingbird Festival, 
and have sponsored my trip uh, to provide present banding demonstrations and lectures to them this fall uh, down in the uh, end of July, 31st, I think it's, uh, 27th through 31st this year in Sedona, Arizona. And I'd also very much like to thank my board of directors, Dr. Jim Boone, who's located in Nevada. And I think most of you might recognize this person here, Dr. Marianne Bishop, who's one of our lead scientists here at the Science Center. Uh, I do not have a web page, but I have a Facebook page. And so if you just look up Alaska Hummingbird Project on Facebook, you'll get to see lots of pretty pictures and information about what's going on with the project. So with that, um, where are the rufuses right now? So this is this afternoon's eBird. So they just showed up right here in Glacier Bay Park, just outside of Juneau. There's a really big snow load right here. Um, so it, they might be a little late this year unless we get some rain to knock down the snow off the bushes. But you never can tell. So with that, thank you very, very much for coming. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. And while we're answering questions, I've got some specimens here to pass around you can look at. If you want to handle these, I'm an adult male, an adult female, and an immature male. Try to handle them by the bill um, and the tag rather than holding them by the body. Because the oils on your fingers might tend to pull those feathers out in the end. So I'll pass these around so you guys can look at them. And any questions anybody have? Where the vortex of power is and all Correct. That. The center of the vortex. So is this group you're going to, is, is it scientists or wackos or a <laughs> mixture of both? <laughs> no, I'm serious. The <laughs> International Hummingbird Society has been has been hosting the Sedona Hummingbird Festival for probably about 20 years. It is a um, semi-annual festival. So every two years it's put on. Sedona is a dead center migration hotspot. And we have several amazing banding hosts um, who have been feeding and hosting hummingbirds for decades. Uh, one of our banding hosts is this amazing house right on the edge of the Red Rocks. Um, and she maintains about 10 hummingbird feeders, the big ones. She goes through gallons of feed every day. She probably has around 2,000 birds in her yard every day at peak migration of about five different hummingbird species. Wow. So that's black chins, broad, broad tails, uh, calliopes, uh, costas, uh, rufuses, and annas. So that's six. Yeah. And then sometimes we get hybrids down there, which really makes it fun. So they're they're a decent group of people. It's it's more than just like. Um, the uh, down here in Alaska, Yakutat, uh, it's not Yakutat, somewhere in the southeast, they also have a hummingbird festival, and I forget what they call it. Yakutat has a turn festival, which is another hummingbird festival down south, and that's mostly like a garden and art show. But the Sedona Hummingbird Festival, they have gardens and they have art and they have vendors who are selling hummingbird like stuff, but they also have us. Um, we, uh, there'll be three of us master class hummingbird banders, including one of my, my mentors, my banding instructor, will be down there. Uh, we'll be providing banding demonstrations and scientific lectures on our research. Great. Mm -hmm. Dave. Is it uh, any sign of uh, bird flu with hummingbirds? Uh, the Bird Banding Laboratory sent out some information on that last year, and they haven't sent anything out this year yet. And basically what they're telling us is there's never been a documented case of bird avian flu within a hummingbird, but that doesn't mean that they can't get it. Um, so we were advised to take a little bit extra precaution. So one of the things like I did was I each, um, let me go back to one of my pictures. So each time I handle a bird, two items are used on the bird. Um, whoops. One is this bag, the net bag that the bird is hanging in, and the other is right there is the sock. And there's another request. This is the toe of a nylon pantyhose. Anybody still has nylons hanging out in their um, sock drawers, cut off the foot and send it to me because I use them. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And so every time I handle a bird, um, this gets washed and put away, and a clean one is used for each bird. I wipe off all the um, instrumentation with alcohol and my hand, keep my hands clean at the same time. Um, I did have an interesting um, incident last summer, and I didn't think about avian flu till later, because Occam's razor says the most plausible explanation is usually the, you know, the correct one. So I was, I was over at Bob and Barb Jewels, and they had uh, about four feeders up, and they were swarmed with bees. I mean, just swarmed with bees. And there was a female that was just on the feeder, and she was on her way out. You know, she was like, tipping over. And I just assumed that she had gotten stung by bees, which does happen, and it will kill a bird. And I did not, I did not submit that bird, and I probably should have just, just to be double certain that that's what had killed that bird. Yes. You're gonna tell us that how to deal with the aggressive uh, birds in the late summer? Yep. So um, males, once they are, are done mating and they're feeding up, they become extremely aggressive, even more so than you thought they were aggressive to begin with. Now they're even more aggressive because they're being super selfish now. And they will keep everybody off the feeder. So the best thing to do, if you have the space to do it, give him his feeder and then go over here and set up a little cluster of feeders. The females and the young will come to this, leave the male that one, and then they can gang up on the male and keep them chased away. Now bees, that's the one you really have to worry about. So one of the things that you can do, um, oops, I wanted to point out a couple of things there. Um, I'm going the wrong direction. Um, <clears throat> So the feeders, most of your feeders have these yellow flowers on here. These see the color yellow, and they're attracted to the color yellow. These little flowers will pop off. You could take them off your feeder, but that can cause some problems because then the porthole underneath it is a little large. It tends to spill out a little more. You get more buds in there, what have you. So if you can get the feeders that have the white flowers instead of the yellow flowers, that's super helpful. Another thing that I will do is I try to keep the feeders really clean. Um, you know, it's windy, the feeders, you know, Jay comes and lands on it, you got syrup spilling out on it and it's getting all sticky and that's attracting the bees. So I just keep a spray bottle of water and I just keep that, the feeder face sprayed down to keep that stickiness level down. And then if it gets really bad, I'll take a dish, a shallow dish, you can put a stone or some sticks in it or whatever, and I'll put a solution of um, sugar water that's like double what I would give the hummingbirds, and I put it off to the side, about 10 to 15 feet away from the feeders, and then I, for that first hour or two, I'm really aggressive, whenever the bees land on the feeders, I squirt them off until they key into that dish. Once they've keyed into that dish, which is a higher level of sugar than what's in your hummingbird feeder, then they will go to that dish and they will leave your feeders alone. But you got to remember to keep that dish filled. So now you're feeding bees and hummingbirds. This may be too much work for some people. <laughs> <laughs> just thought I'd let that happen. Um, Could you just take the yellow flowers to them? Take some fingernail polish to them, maybe. Try that. Yeah. Any other questions? Hello. Have you or anybody in the room ever seen a hummingbird nest in Cordova? Not in Cordova. And no. that's one of the things I'm really trying to track down. But that's bizarre, because everywhere else people find hummingbird nests pretty readily. Bruce Campbell, I think, years ago may have found one in his yard, but that is like the only record of a hummingbird nest. So do you remember Cordova. the Petersons um, at Pierce's Auto? Um, his wife, she told me about um, that she had spotted a hummingbird nest in the tree outside her kitchen window. And they had that big, tall house, and her kitchen window was on the second floor. And she was telling me about the fall after she had seen that. And I had asked her to keep me apprised for the next mm -hmm. season. And then COVID hit, and then they left town. Mm -hmm. So that was one that I, I was certain about. And so what I think these birds are doing is they're nesting at about 100, 200 feet up in the depths of these spruce trees. 
and that makes sense. They're protected, they're sheltered up there. Yeah. Hmm. And because I, the ones that live around my house, always, I watch them head to a certain set of alders uh, across the yard, and they're always making that run mm -hmm. into course, that specific area. They do not go straight to the nest. Yeah. So they'll go to another spot, and then they might make sure nobody's looking, and then they go to the nest. They will never take a direct line from the feeder to the nest. And they have favorite, they have favorite spots they like to hang out. I'd love to photograph one here, a nest in Cordova, if anybody should happen to find one. I would love for you to photograph one. <laughs> maybe, maybe he's right. Maybe they're up really hot. Well, that, yeah. that, so the only logical thing is it's something to stumble is. into. Yeah. Yeah. If they too were many good birds. Yeah. Have you found any, did you find any nests in Chicago? No. No. And, you know, it makes sense because down south in California and stuff, they find them in, in berry bushes and rose bushes and stuff like that. Up here, if they're in the salmon berry bushes, those nests are going to get trashed because everybody's crashing through the bushes to get to the berries and stuff. So they're not, they're not going to be down here where they can get, it's not to say that they wouldn't, but it makes more sense for them to be higher up in the trees rather than uh, low in the bushes. Oh, higher ladder should we get from our little ones? Open with the ladder. Some tree climbing here. I wanted to point out in this particular photo that here's an example of a hummingbird, a trochilid, flying upside down and backwards at the same time. <laughs> That's <funny. laughs> Aaron? Oh, oh no. I know. You're just looking at the And how many birds do you see, Milo? We love to play this game. There's one, two, three, four, six. five, six, and I think there's a, a seven right there. Yeah. But that was one of the a, a big spring. Um, occasionally, you'll get the males have just shown up, and then we'll get a drop in temperature, a raise in dew point. There's nothing blooming. The insects have gone to ground, and then these guys are swarming the feeders. I haven't seen a swarm like this in years. Yeah. And like I said, Rufus hummingbirds are having a hard time. People come up to me all the time and say, it just doesn't seem like there's as many hummingbirds around as they're used to. And you know what? You're right. There aren't. There aren't. Which makes studying Anna's hummingbirds so really interesting. And I hope I get a chance to come back and do that lecture again, uh, our winter hummingbird, Anna's in Alaska, because that's a bird species that's doing a rapid range expansion into Alaska and whose population is exploding. And these birds are pretty much in the same habitat, so why? What time of year are they here? They, we start seeing them in the fall after the rufuses leave. Okay. And we get them on the Christmas bird count. We'll have you back in the fall. <laughs> <laughs> Follow up, part two. <laughs> exactly, absolutely. <laughs> Any other questions? Anything online? Any questions online? Um, not that I see, no. Again, thank you so much. Oh, she's coming. Are the um, <laughs> birds as territorial, are the males as territorial when they're migrating as they are? No. When they're when they're nesting. They're and still little. Um, Rufuses are so aggressive, uh, especially amongst all the other hummingbird species. So when I'm down in Sedona banding, We've got all these species all hitting the feeders all at once. And they're chasing each other around, but they're also really hungry. And so it's kind of like bears at the fishing hole in the fall, where they might not be as comfortable with each other. Any other time of year, this time of year, they need to feed up. That's the feeding source, and so they tolerate each other. So. Um, Dottie online has a question, actually. Yes. Uh, Dottie, do you want to ask? Um, I didn't. I, I wasn't able to be at the beginning. But what what makes them come to Alaska? What is it that drives them to Alaska? That is a great question. When you think about how short of a time period these birds are up here, the males are up here for barely two months, and the females for barely three months. So that speaks to the richness of this habitat. That these birds are going to travel all these miles to come up here to breed, where most you know, Anna's are breeding in California, and they could be doing you know two two nests a year, sometimes three. Uh, so that's a question that we don't have the answer to, Dottie, except the fact that we all know and love Alaska, and there's no other better place to be in the summertime, <laughs> right? 
buried in bugs. <laughs> That's right. Oh, and I forgot to talk about bug picking. So I did mention that hummingbirds eat bugs. They eat a lot of bugs, and a lot of people don't know that. So like, there's an, a hummingbird here in the wintertime, and so what in the world is it eating? Well, they're bug picking. So if you're watching your hummingbirds this year in your yard, you'll notice they'll, they'll get a little exposed twig, and then they'll go out and grab that gnat and come back. And they'll go out and grab that mosquito and come back just like any other flycatcher will do. And we'll also bug pick off the uh, sapsucker wells and the sticky sap of the uh, willows and the alders. So they're getting that nice bug snack. Do you like our spider webs as well? Well, the females will use the spider webs in nest building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you again so much for coming. I certainly appreciate it. Thank you, Kate.